Uh, okay, so welcome to the first panel of the conference, which aims to give an overview of the activities and achievements of each participati participating encyclopedia since the first European Encyclopedia Conference in Brussels in 2019. So we are supposed to give uh, to address experiences, obstacles and challenges in the past three years during the global crisis, especially given the COVID-19 pandemic and armed conflicts. That is in the era marked by the increasing amount of disinformation and misinformation. Eric Bostad, editor-in-chief of the Great Norwegian Encyclopedia, which is actually the initiator of this collaboration, of European and North American encyclopedias will give the introduction to the discussion. So, Eric, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, it's three years since we met in Brussels. Um, I think this this was one of the best meetings I've actually ever been to. Um, I've been traveling around meeting encyclopedias around Europe um, a few months before this, and it was the first time I'd ever met anyone who worked making encyclopedias. And when we got in Brussels, I think like most of the people who were there had never ever met another encyclopedia editor. It felt quite... Uh, we sort of felt sparks in the room. It was, um, uh, it was really, really nice. Um, the past three years have been quite dominated by three things. Um, uh, we talked a lot about it in our web um, meeting um, last year and how it affected our readership figures. Uh, we, as most of you, got COVID lucky, uh, which was the term that we coined uh, at our last meeting. Uh, we had exploding user figures. Um, and we also developed a lot of new ways to work um, because we're all suddenly stuck at home and so were all the professors, at least in Norway. Um, and I think the pandemic sort of gave us a new understanding of our role. Um, we saw that we, like, our article on the pandemic itself wasn't read that much, but uh, everything else sort of exploded. How, like, statistics, how are these uh, numbers that the government are coming with, how do they make them? Um, the Spanish flu, the Black Plague, uh, and all kinds of related topics that weren't really covered that much in media. And it sort of, it gave, at least it gave us a different understanding of our role. Um, and then for a while Donald Trump dominated everything, and our most read article in the past year has been narcissistic personality disorder. Um, it, it, it used to be read like you know five times a day, uh, and in the past year it, it has been read uh, since Trump started behaving like a maniac. It's been read 250,000 times, um, and it just it doesn't stop. It's still on our top list of most read articles, and I'm not really um, sure why. And of course, Putin and Russia affects a lot. Um, we, have, um, we have a lot of security issues, uh, both in the encyclopedias, but also in the rest of the world that really affects us. I'm going to present some of the stuff that we've learned during the, during the um, uh, pandemic. Um, but I'll start, since there are a few people here today that haven't met us before, uh, a lot of things I say will be, uh, it's from our perspective and our history, so I'll just give a very quick introduction to, um, to our history. Uh, I'll also share some results of our results from the last years, how we see usage uh, change, uh, and how the public's image of us have changed. And then I'll talk a little about our production model, um, and I'll finish off by highlighting some issues that I think have common uh, interest for all of us. So I'll be really quick to start with and then sort of slow down. And I like to get interrupted. Uh, so if you have reflections or comments or questions, I think it could sort of evolve into a sort of conversation here as well. So please, um, please interrupt me. Uh, the 
ja, stora norska lexikon it could mean either the big norwegian encyclopedia but our predecessors decided to call us the great which sounds quite pompous in uh, in english uh, the encyclopedia was founded in 1905 and they started publishing in 1906 one year after norway regained independence uh, Norway's two encyclopedias merged in 1975, when was, uh, which is when we were born. Uh, our website was launched in 2000. Um, and then the old publishing house decided to publish uh, the, what is it, the ninth edition of the paper encyclopedia in 2005, and then they went bankrupt. Um, so in 2011, we were uh, rescued by Norway's two largest foundations um, and kept alive by uh, donations, basically. Um, so for, since 19, from 1905 to 2010, we were like a uh, private for-profit publishing house. Uh, then we turned into a non-profit um, organization. We got a totally new team. None of the old editors stayed on. It was a total break. Um, and they started rethinking the encyclopedia. Then no one knew if they were going to get paid the next month because we were in such economical difficulties. Um, but in 2015, we got a sort of new organization in place. We're now owned by all the Norwegian universities and a few other um, organizations. Um, these are our owners, uh, or they're members of the association that own the encyclopedia, and they provide about half of our money. We have around 40 different sources of income. Uh, it's these ones, and several other, uh, both public and non-public uh, sources of income. So it's all the universities, uh, some of the colleges, uh, the science academies, uh, writers' unions, the National Museum. Uh, we have a lot of different organizations that uh, fund us and, and our members. Um, if I'm going to go back to our little timeline, I mean, we were saved. We had got a new organization back in 2015. Uh, in 2018, the EPRS report um, uh, came which totally changed our, uh, our image, both of ourselves, but also our outlook on the rest of uh, Europe. So I would also like to say thank you to Naya for doing it, because it, we wouldn't have been here today. Uh, up until 2018, we had been really busy trying to fix our encyclopedia, and uh, then suddenly we realized, oh, there are more encyclopedias in the world. Uh, let's uh, make some new friends. Uh, the EPRS report also had the effect that the Danish encyclopedia uh, moved into our publishing system and are now on our servers and um, at least to some extent have copied our production model. Um, uh, Erik took our annual report, translated it to Danish and called it strategy. Um, which is really nice because suddenly we have very, very close colleagues that we cooperate a lot with. It's really made a big um, impact on us as well. Um, I thought I should like to take out one little thing that's happened each year. Uh, last year we celebrate our anniversary. That's one of uh, the things I, I'm going to give as a sort of take home point. Having big parties really pay off. Um, I'll come back to that. Uh, and this year we've secured funding for a new children's encyclopedia, which I'm really uh, happy about. Guru, wave your hand, is the project leader. Uh, it will be one of the largest... Um, uh, it, it will be a big encyclopedia for children with easier text and for other people with sort of reading um, problems. We're going to launch it next year. I'll say a little bit more about that later on as well. Okay, a um, little bit about our status. We had we got a research agency to ask 5,000 Norwegians how they what they thought about the SNL uh, this January. 
and we see that we are quite well known and used by young people. Um, we still, the last time I showed you these figures, they weren't, um, they were even worse. Uh, we see that we have like between 80 and 90 percent uh, recognition among young people. Um, but in this, like from 30 and upwards, and especially in like 50 and 60 plus, we're not very well known. This is a huge problem because all money is controlled by people who are above 50 or 60. Um, and status and everything. And the numbers have improved a little bit. And I mean, this problem will solve itself in 30 years time. Uh, but we're a bit more sort of busy um, uh, than that. We also see that they trust us. Um, this, this green sort of piece of this diagram is people who say they trust us uh, to a great extent and to some extent, and then they're a little bit worried and then they don't trust us, it's that little red thing. If we compare it to Wikipedia, we see that we are um, trusted a lot more than, uh, than Wikipedia is, and we also see that we are used for very different purposes. Um, everything changed a little bit with the pandemic, but before the pandemic there were n not a single overlapping article on the Norwegian Wikipedia's 100 most read articles and our 100 most read articles. Uh, what's more read in our encyclopedia is like medicine or history, where it's like it's really good to have a professor uh, that writes the content. Uh, while well, Wikipedia is so much better than us at popular culture and geography. Um, I'll come back to that as well. Um, we see that our usage, um, uh, like the number of visitors, uh, is still increasing. I thought we couldn't grow anymore, but we continue to grow in uh, unique visitors. Norway has five and a half million people. Um, and if, I mean, unique visitors means that if you use your computer and your phone, you're two. But if two people use one computer, you're one. You know, so it's not uh, one to one person to unique visitor, but it's still, it's a very, very high usage um, uh, figure and it continues to, um, continues to grow. But we see that uh, the number of articles read per year will actually fall, probably this year, unless something dramatic happens in um, October, November, and December. I'm not really sure why, but we see a little fall. But our articles will be read about 110 million times uh, this year. Uh, we rely on topic experts that are affiliated, they get paid. Um, most of them are academics at universities. Uh, this is like a big ambition for us to recruit more topic experts. We thought that we needed 1,000 to cover the encyclopedia. We now have 1,000 and we haven't covered the encyclopedia, so maybe we need 1,500. Um, we're not really sure anymore. Uh, but we're only 15 editors, uh, so we have to invent a new way of dealing with 1,500 people uh, who are supposed to be active uh, all the time. Um, yeah. We also have a lot of volunteers. Uh, they are non-paid, uh, we don't know them, but they send in suggestions and, um, or comments. Um, they edit articles and send them in and then the changes have to be approved or not approved by either a topic expert or an editor before, it, uh, before it's published. I, I'd just like to put these into scale uh, because, I mean, the topic experts, they write a lot and they are professors and academics, but in actual people, we have more volunteers contributing, like in actual number of people than the topic experts. And of course, the topic experts write a lot more. But handling these sort of, this kind of feedback uh, has been quite valuable for us. Um, we, this is the number of updated articles per year. Uh, in 2020, first year of the pandemic, 
we updated 82,000 articles in that year. If we divide that per editor, it's 34 per day on average. Um, I think the editorial team still has sort of a post-traumatic stress disorder after this year. But it was because we decided to actually go through every single article in the, in the encyclopedia, edit it, make sure it doesn't look like paper anymore, uh, add more links, um, uh, and check the content, and then give grade it. Uh, is this okay? Uh, does it need improving, or is it a disaster? Um, so now we've gone through every single of our 192,000 articles and checked it. Uh, and please God, never, ever again. Uh, this was extremely uh, stressful. But now we're finished. So now we can sort of go down to, you know, updating more like maybe 50,000 uh, articles per year. Um, our content is in various sort of states. Some of it is good. Uh, so the green here is like the percentage of articles that we now have assessed is okay. Uh, or dark green is excellent, magnificent. And uh, the, this is like excellent. Uh, the yellow ones need updating and the red ones are disasters um, that are to either totally out of date or maybe even factually um, wrong. Um, but at least now we have assessed everything. As I said, we have 192,000 articles, 15 editors, there are 1,000 affiliated topic experts, most of them are academics. 2,000 volunteer contributors, and we now have 4,800 authors. Um, it's only like a quarter of them who are actually active at the moment. Uh, and our budget this year will be unusually high, but it will be around 2.8 million um, uh, euros. Uh, these are all the topic experts, um, or almost all, the ones I could fit into one screen. Uh, we're actually really proud of them. Um, uh, there are, yeah, as I said, most academics, but some are freelance writers in fields where there are no academic research done. Uh, we rec recruit them from sort of very many different sources. We try to recruit as much as possible at, uh, at universities. Um, but we have 1,000 people who have direct access to publish in the encyclopedia. They log on the website and they start publishing. And it's, it goes straight online. We have 2,000 people who send contributions that need verification before it's published. And we do handle like 50 and to the max 80,000 uh, updates to articles every year. So we need, like, we need a so very streamlined work flows to be able to handle this since we're only 15 and stuff uh, everyone's an editor um, we don't have any support uh, systems we don't have any secretaries we don't really have any IT people we don't we're a very scaled down uh, kind of organization um, I just some of you have seen our uh, publishing system before. We've made some tweaks and improvements uh, to it. Um, and I used Google Translate to uh, translate it into um, English. Uh, this is the task list of our topic expert on political science. Um, you see his like, task list uh, here. Uh, his top uh, priority uh, is neo-Nazism, um, which I have um, assessed as a disaster. Um, and the pressure group, which is also a disaster. You can see he's handled suggestions to monarchy, quite a few ones, it was after Elizabeth uh, died. Uh, and he's replied to all his comments and he's handled all his um, the suggestions for improvements that have been uh, sent in. 
Uh, you can also see he's written 49,000 uh, letters so far this year. Um, Marion uh, also wants him to, uh, to look at democracy and Norway's political system and Montesquieu. Um, but I mean, they log on and they see this list and they're supposed to handle it in a way. We don't, we try to avoid email contact with them as much as possible. Um, they get emails if they haven't done anything for a while. Um, but otherwise we try to stay away from email because it takes too much time. We also give him access to uh, statistics. Uh, so he, this is his article. He is responsible for 389 articles. His most read is oligarchy because of Ukraine, of course, which has been read 106,000 times um, in the past year. Um, he also have access to the quality assessment, uh, where we write all the articles on the scale from one to five where one is wonderful and five is disastrous. Uh, so he has two disastrous articles uh, and he has four who are like wonderful. This really has speeded up our whole production because uh, it's so much more efficient than the way we used to work before. Um, it's, and it's so much easier to actually just give them access to publish and then we check it afterwards. Uh, so every day, two of the editors go through these kind of lists of all the articles that have been updated in the encyclopedia the day before, and we read everything, assess it. Um, if someone sort of feels like, mm, I'm not sure about this, uh, then the editor is responsible for that field, will take a closer look and maybe even ask for a sort of peer review of a topic. Um, but this is our way of trying to turn the editorial team into a machine. You know, dum, 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 dum. Uh, making everything a lot faster. Um, that was our production model. I'm now going to focus on things that I would like us to um, um, to talk about and things that I would uh, suggest that you do uh, as well or good ideas. Uh, so now it's time to start interrupting me. Uh, and I try to start with things that are most close to us and uh, end up at the more general level so it can just sort of uh, change into a, a common conversation. Uh, the smartest thing that we did last year was having um, uh, what we called the Great Norwegian Party, um, which was our 10th anniversary since the rescue operation and 115 years since the first paper, uh, paper book. I'd actually rented the pub uh, and I thought we would have, you know, some speeches and maybe drink some beer and yeah. Then our board of managers came and said, we are not going to be in a pub, are you insane? And they insisted we should invite the king and be in like the town hall of Oslo, which is a very, very, very big venue. We end up here instead, uh, and I mean, it's quite pompous uh, and quite big. Um, and we only really had three, yeah, three weeks to prepare because the board also decided the date. Um, but we managed to get a lot of, we're very lucky, it was just between two lockdowns. So people hadn't been to a party for two months and then it opened up and we had 500 people at the party and then everything shut down again. Um, but we managed to get like the, um, uh, the Minister for Education, the Directorate for Education, uh, the State Secretary for Culture, a lot of um, sort of state agencies and a few private companies um, in that room. And then we forced all these officials to give speeches on us. And of course, now it's impossible not to give us a lot of comp compliments. So when the Minister of Culture stand, like, is on the, um, uh, like, speaks about this in a very, you know, very flattering way, it sort of influences the whole mood quite a bit. 
So when I went on stage there and said, we have an idea. We would like to launch a children's encyclopedia and we need two million euros. We, we got most of the funding from just having like one party and forcing a lot of people to say nice things about us. And I think it's an idea to copy um, in a way. And please don't quote me like too much on this, but uh, it, it was, uh, yeah, it, it was a success. Uh, the small Norwegian encyclopedia or the little Norwegian encyclopedia, um, we're going to launch it next year. Uh, we're thinking of maybe around 5,000 uh, articles. Uh, we're imagining a target user who's like 11 years old. So the text should be um, understandable to an 11 year old. Um, we're not going to use our topic experts to write articles because we don't think it's possible to teach a professor to write for an 11 year old. Um, but we, need, we are going to use uh, topic experts to verify the content. Um, yeah, and if you ask Guru, she can tell you everything about um, all the plans. And I'm really, I'm looking forward to telling you about it after we sort of uh, launched it and gained more experience. Um, we're now in sort of research phase. We're going to find out what the articles should be like, what kind of level, and then we'll start writing in maybe January. And then we're going to launch in September. Um, yeah, it makes me a little bit afraid. But we've done big things before, so maybe we could do it again. Um, I would also like to sort of point out uh, we've spent a lot of time with the Latvian encyclopedia in the past few years. Um, you have to see this, Valtish. You have a little heart. Um, it's been uh, our whole editorial team in Norway and Latvia have spent maybe in total two weeks together, a little more, um, where we just discussed like how we work, how um, how we prioritize, and we discussed beer, and we've been drinking beer uh, and a bit. A bit. But we spent quite a lot of time together um, because it's good for the editors to actually meet other people that work with encyclopedias. Um, and I th really think the rest of you should do this as well. It doesn't have to be very advanced. You know, you can just put editors from two countries in the same office uh, and they'll start chatting. And it can be all kinds of topics. Um, I took the time, the first time the Danish encyclopedia visited us, it took 14 minutes before they started discussing uh, the semicolon. Um, but it can also be more, you know, big topics. Um, I also would like to uh, point out the Danish encyclopedia and I have another little heart um, for the um, for the dance. Um, it's been one probably the most important thing that has happened to the Norwegian encyclopedia for decades that the Danish encyclopedia just uh, they're now using all our technology and have like they're using our authors guidance guidelines and uh, we're looking at a lot of joint projects. Um, we've looked at how we rank in the search engines. Uh, we're looking at pictures and images. They're going to translate all our medical articles uh, into Danish. It's a, it's a very, very, very close cooperation, um, which has been really useful for us. And uh, I asked if I was allowed to show this, but, uh, oh no, yeah. Uh, this first, this like the Danish and the Norwegian article on Croatia. Uh, and I mean, you can see how similar it is. But I don't think any of our users will discover that we are by now 
very, very, very similar because a Norwegian is not very likely to use a Danish encyclopedia and the other way around. Um, I just wanted to show this to, uh, I don't know, uh, I'm so impressed by the Danes. Uh, they have decided that, um, how many people were you last year? Five? Four editors? Three editors last year. And from May you are 17. Um, they have decided since we have 1,000 topic experts, they want to have 1,000 topic experts. It took, and one, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it took us 10 years to recruit ours. 10 years. Uh, they're going to do this in uh, one and a half year. So this is like an ad that they put into like some newspapers. And it's like, um, it's incredibly am ambitious. I mean, they have recruiting systems and we are like, you're going to recruit 500 topic experts this year? Oh, wow. So I'm, I'm uh, naming the Danish encyclopedia the most ambitious encyclopedia in the world and I just wanted to um, tell it to all of you. Um, uh, the dance will talk tomorrow. Um, so, I mean, when I talk about streamlining workflows and uh, production methods, um, they're really the ones um, to, um, to ask. <laughs> Another topic, and now it's really time to start uh, interrupting me, and I'm waiting for you, Valtish. Um, Another topic that I think we should talk about, maybe over beer, maybe here, uh, is our... Yeah. <laughs> or afterwards. Uh, we sort of decide to start moving away from Wikipedia's best content. Um, oh, that was quite blurry. Uh, this is an article that we have now deleted. Uh, about Reading, uh, which is a city in Pennsylvania in the USA. Um, and this is the English Wikipedia's article in the same city. You can't really see it here, but if you see, yeah, you can see our article on top there, and then you see Wikipedia's article on the same city on the side. I'm not sure why we had an article on Reading, Pennsylvania. Uh, I have no idea how it ended up in the encyclopedia to start with, but it's been there since the 70s. And someone's updated it every now and then. So it's like the number of inhabitants were like, it wasn't wrong, and there was nothing bad about it, but there's no reason in the world why a Norwegian encyclopedia should have articles on how many cities did we have in the US? 500? 900 cities in the US were in the Norwegian encyclopedia. It's insane. Um, and we, and we paid the users, as we this yeah. article. So we paid for revisions. Yeah. No, we, I mean, for every single revision, we pay someone to update this article, and it's insane. Um, we have deleted around 50,000 articles. Um, not all of them, because we're trying to move away from Wikipedia's best content, but quite a lot of them. Um, and we are moving away from, we don't say this publicly really, but I thought it's an interesting thing to talk about it uh, when all of us are here. Um, but we're trying to move away from content where Wikipedia's production model means that they get really good content. And our production model uh, with professors and topic experts and academics, where it gives really poor content. And this especially applies to geography and popular culture. How many articles? Have you, how many articles? <laughs> are there in your encyclopedia? They are not on Wikipedia. Are there any? Ooh, about 25,000. 
Um, I mean, we are a lot better than Wikipedia on medicine. Um, we have a, like, we're big on like sort of medical topics and diseases and stuff that can happen to you. We're a lot better than Wikipedia on law and to some extent history. Um, and I really think we should be a lot better than Wikipedia on these kind of topics because it's obvious that a professor will write a much better article on um, thrombosis or lung disease than a volunteer or 50 volunteers. It's obvious they give us better uh, content, but I think it, it sort of it applies the other way around as well. I think we should move slowly and maybe not publicly uh, away from content where Wikipedia is prone to be better. Sorry, uh, now we are talking about English version of the Wikipedia or the uh, Norwegian version? It's a difficult question, but uh, I'm talking about both. Um, I mean, we could compare ourselves to the Norwegian uh, version, but in reality, we know that most Norwegians can read a lot of the English Wikipedia without any problem. Um, yeah, but it's a big, big, big question. We have talked a lot, Eric, mm -hmm. on, on these issues, really, and you know my attitude. And uh, I think all of you who are uh, based on printed versions, you're victimized by printed versions. So, in a sense, you have content which is not as good as we would like or you would like to have. So, in our case, it's simply all, everything is much better than in Wikipedia mm. we have. So, and, and, and of course, our content is considerably smaller than in your case. You have much bigger, but uh, I think, well, my point is, well, <laughs> I don't think it's a good idea to move away just because you can't compete. You can. And you can just create, well, good articles. And I think, well, encyclopedia is always perceived as a whole in everything. Mm -hmm. There should be also popular culture and probably you can't, and you should not go into details, but uh, Wikipedia does, but Again, Wikipedia is a social network. It's not, uh, well, kind of, well, Bruno was uh, just, how did you call it? Very nice, his description was. Warehouse of books. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, no, but I mean, really, it's just, uh, it's not created by experts, and we pretend to have a resource which is created by experts, which is not anonymous. It's, and uh, I don't think we should just fluctuate according to the Wikipedia's uh, developments. We should have our own line of development and go this way. So just to think, uh, always there will be some articles which are lesser read or, or more read, or of course medicine, definitely. There could be only, but actually ep ep epidemics and epidemiology is becoming kind of, everyone knows everything about this issue, so it's just, everything is relative. I quite like the phrase that we're victims of our paper encyclopedias. I mean, we're also children of our uh, paper encyclopedias. Um, we wouldn't have been where we are today without the paper encyclopedia. But um, uh, also, um, a lot of the stuff they did on paper, they never knew what was read and what was interesting, and they never really deleted everything. And not anything, because they, uh, that was like a big selling point for them, how many articles they have. Um, so they never really deleted ever anything. And we started deleting. And we delete and delete and delete. And it's also like, what are the most important cities in the US, or in China, or in Germany? 
should we have articles on uh, every region in China? We do now. We have every prefecture in Japan. Should we? Not sure. Uh, it's sort of a, an ongoing discussion, um, but we're like slowly moving away. Um, I think we should talk more about this because it's, it's interesting on a European level as well. And I think Naya in several of her speeches have pointed out the sort of the importance of uh, giving access to um, content in everyone's own language and not relying on the English um, Wikipedia as well. So I think this just, I just want to sort of put it into your head and put it into the, discu uh, the discussion. Another little topic that I uh, would like to share is, and some of you have heard me uh, speak about this before, I have some other examples now. But we have experimented by machine-generated text for five, six years. Um, uh, this is uh, just, um, I'm going to give you some examples. Um, this is one article on Rukan, which is a town, and Trondheim, which is a municipality or a, and a big city um, in Norway. Uh, in the uh, Rukan article, uh, the first part of the article uh, that says Rukan is a town in uh, the Tin municipality in the county of Vestfold uh, and Telmark. Uh, it has, it's 2.6 kilometers big and has 3,038 inhabitants. Uh, it's written by a machine. Um, in the article about Trondheim, uh, we have a section about energy production that says how much energy is produced in this municipality, what power plants do they have, uh, and how is energy uh, consumed, which is also written by a machine. Um, so we've experimented with scripts that generate small blocks of text that we can put into the articles and update it automatically once or twice a year. Because it saves us, I mean, our article on Rukan is fine. We don't really need to update it other than population figures uh, more often than maybe every five years. Um, but we've been paying people to update population figures and minor details uh, for many years, and we don't want to do, to do that anymore. We want to sort of speed up everything. And I mean, this applies to a lot of things. It applies to uh, countries and mountains and even animals. Um, and yeah. So, uh, we learned quite a lot. We struggled for um, a few years to find sort of how should we do this in a practical and also technical way. How we're going to integrate text written by a machine uh, and which will be updated by a machine um, and combine it with text written by a human at a different time. Uh, we think we sort of found uh, a solution. It's these kind of blocks, allocating blocks in the articles that are set aside for uh, like computer-generated text, because it means that we can keep it updated and accurate. Because it's also a fact that professors are not very accurate. We can say they are very good, but professors are generally not very... Um, they don't care that much about details. Uh, so by make, letting the machine write the details, the professors can explain why, it's, uh, why it is this way. Um, just this summer, uh, and now you can laugh, uh, and you're allowed to laugh, um, but we, in June, uh, we published articles on every single species of birds in the world. It's an experiment. Uh, we're going to have it's 10,000 different birds in the world. Uh, we're going to have them online for a year and then assess them uh, and see if anyone reads them. This is the most read um, uh, bird article. 
Um, we had a doctor in ornithology, who, no, in biology, who uh, worked for us for a while. Uh, he found a lot of databases about birds, and so he's written these kind of texts. So it's like the make a fig parrot, a small parrot in the parakeet family, its national distribution in Oceania and Southeast Asia. As an adult, it's 14 centimeters long and weighs 42 grams. Uh, it's associated with farmland, urban areas, tropical forest, blah, blah, blah. And it has lays two eggs and they build um, nests in cavities. Um, yeah. It's, it's an okay article on the species of bird in Australia. Um, it's entirely written by script. And I don't think we will have, it, this is just an experiment for a little while. Uh, I don't think we will have any articles that are entirely written by machine. Uh, but it's an interesting experiment uh, for, like, to have online for a year. I think probably we will, we will delete them, but it's interesting to see if anyone reads it. And at least it contributes a Norwegian name to every species of bird in the world. Um, one of my last points is a uh, recommendation. Uh, it's also Wikipedia. Um, have any of you seen these kind of links that are at the bottom of Wikipedia articles? Mm -hmm. uh, it says authority data. Um, we also had, uh, we paid a Wikipedian, uh, or he got a summer job uh, at our office this summer for six weeks um, to put links to the SNL in, into Wikidata and the Wikipedia's authority data. It, I really recommend doing this, um, and I recommend to do it on a large scale, because it means that you will get a lot of links to you, which is good for you, but it also means that you can start using uh, parts of Wikipedia um, uh, in your encyclopedias. Um, we, the same guy who had this summer job, he also downloaded 10,000 portraits from Wikipedia um, for biographies in our encyclopedia, which didn't have any pictures. And of course, all the pictures on Wikipedia, is like it, it's free to use, uh, but we, I mean, we have to look them. So we now looked at, he downloaded 10,000 pictures, and we've had someone look at 3,000 of them and have published them, and we're going to go through the last 7,000 uh, now. But the thing that enabled us to do this were all these links here, because we now have a one-to-one -one relation between our articles and the Wikipedia article. And uh, an article in our encyclopedia about the person becomes a lot better if there's a picture of that person in the article. You know, you can see it's a person, and you can see the gender, and about how old they are. And it, it just it makes our article, articles better. So this is something I recommend. And my final thing is security. Um, I said it in the uh, previous session, but we, we're facing a lot of security issues now. Uh, the thing that bothers us the most is DDoS attacks. Um, we have a lot of security systems in place that sh should handle the DDoS attacks, but say, like just last week, we were attacked by maybe 10,000 Android phones all over the world um, at the same time. So obviously, uh, this guy has access to apps on Android phones uh, that are obviously quite widely used all over the world and that can um, launch attacks on us, which are really, really hard to stop. Uh, this summer, uh, these kind of DDoS attacks have taken down almost every single Norwegian newspaper. Uh, my bank <coughs> didn't work for like an hour, 
Um, they took down the Parl Parliament's website. We struggled. Um, it's really quite damaging. We, we still haven't seen anyone break into our system, um, but I mean, it, it's going to happen uh, at some stage. Uh, we're just trying to sort of put on as much security as possible. But these DDoS attacks, uh, if you haven't had them yet, you're going to get them. Uh, and they're really quite damaging. Uh, because It means that we can't publish because our database is so preoccupied by handling all these requests that we can't publish. Um, and it only lasts like a few minutes, but imagine when, they, when it gets like to an even bigger scale. Yeah. These were my sort of uh, things I just want to put into your heads and put into the um, uh, discussion. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, these two days. So, thank you. Okay, so now we will open the floor for discussion. If mm -hmm. there are any questions, comments, anything? Eric, I would like to ask uh, about the databases you use. Uh, let's say for um, for geographic um, articles. Do you because how how you check uh, that the database is updated that it is uh, really the, the there are the latest numbers and mm. we don't really trust very many of the databases. Uh, with some exceptions, like the Statistical Bureau of Norway, we trust. And the um, Energy Authority, we trust. But um, more sort of public databases, we tend to do a lot of checking. Uh, and we also remove odds. You, know, you sort all the numbers, then you remove the 10% bottom and 10% top, and then this looks like rubbish and like with the birds I mean we had a PhD in biology who uh, looked at these databases for months uh, before we published um, so I mean you need to fact check databases as well but it's a lot faster to fact check a database and find sort of errors there than in the corresponding number of articles. Thank you. I'm Nils from Denmark and I could witness that without Naya's articles and us having cooperation with SNL, we would never have been where we are in Denmark. So we are extremely grateful for all the help we have got from Naya's articles and from SNL from Norway. More comments or questions? That you have, you, that you deleted about 50,000 articles. Uh, what about search engines when they find, since they, when they suggest articles which do not exist anymore? We redirect. Uh, so if someone tried to open Reading in Pennsylvania, they will get redirected to the geography of the USA, I think. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we try not to make any broken links. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, you just uh, you opened up, uh, uh, especially this question of deleting articles, as we have uh, we have a lot, lot less articles than you do. We have about 71, 72,000 articles. And the majority of it is, a, is from the print edition, which the majority of it is revised. Or otherwise, maybe in some cases, we wrote a totally new article because we were unsatisfied in those lousy articles with them. But I, as an editor in chief, always I'm somehow afraid to delete articles. Never mind. 
We, I, I, uh, I, we have a reading in Pennsylvania alongside reading in the uh, United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. And it's a small article. It's obviously uh, uh, comparing to the article of reading in uh, 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 English Wikipedia is mm -hmm. insignificant. But somehow I'm always uncomfortable with deleting the article if it's okay with the information that we have in it. And it's okay, we have few information about uh, population or something like that, the geographical position. And I, it's a, I think uh, from my perspective it's a courageous decision to uh, delete so many articles uh, 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 acting in that, uh, in that context. And the, for the, uh, uh, what Niels uh, uh, said, we have to be objective as editors, uh, but if you have an article on Trump, let's say Trump, who is now in retirement and hopefully will stay there. Uh, uh, you, yes, but is it, are we supposed to have only facts? He was... He finished the school, he was a private entrepreneur, he blah, 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 and then he became, a, he was a elected a Republican candidate, president, and things like that. Or we have to give some sort of a, of a comment, of interpretation. Do we, we had, in our article, we said that he is in the tradition of an American populism, uh, he has a sort of inflammatory rhetoric, and things like that. We don't, I don't think that it's, uh, it's not neutral. I think it's, it's a description of his presidency and his uh, political, political positions. So it's a, it's a fine, we need to find a fine balance between being uh, objective and giving, giving uh, 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 I think, uh, some sort of, yes, Eric. Yeah, just exactly, so interpretation good, comment no. Right, so this is, it's about language even when we speak yes. about it. Mm -hmm. just, just came to think of it when you said it. So we wouldn't probably not make a comment on who he is, but no, we would, sort of yes, yeah. that we have to do. I was just reading today uh, our uh, latest article on Felix Mendelssohn, you know, the composer. And now the author is kind of a musicologist, well, well known, and we are always fighting with him. He tries to describe it in a kind of uh, artistic way, and we are just trying to shorten and, and <laughs> get it down to earth. But then again, I, I was thinking, should I do this always? Because it's a music, and uh, you can't, it's, a, it's not a math. It's more difficult to describe and to evaluate and to... And uh, readers need uh, some conclusions from experts. So it's a risk for every encyclopedia. It was not risk for printed volumes because there were four, four lines just. But now we are, we are facing a different structure for articles and, and we have to offer uh, kind of conclusions, kind of... What the, what is Trump, what what were the consequences of Trump's actions, or uh, or why we do still remember Mendelssohn? Why is he so popular? So I think it's it's a very vague border, and it's very kind of very difficult, extremely difficult. And I think the key is author, whom we trust, his expert, and his name is there. And if there will be some problems, audience will kill him, not us, <laughs> to be cynical. Uh, I don't really think it's that difficult to cover, like, especially Trump, because it's so he's so visible, and everyone sort of heard about him. So uh, this is like the content in our article about tr Trump. It's like his different impeachments and the Russia investigations. It's like you can just state blatant fact and you don't really even need that much analysis uh, about him. But picking up on deleting, uh, because when I started in the encyclopedia, we were sort of two branch, uh, two sort of divisions in the editorial team. Uh, I was the it's forbidden to delete article guy. 
uh, Guru was we should delete quite a lot. Um, and I, it took me a while, but I really changed my opinion because uh, to a certain extent we are victims of our paper encyclopedias where people didn't really use to delete. And I also don't think there's a reason why the Croatian Encyclopedia should have an article on Reading in Pennsylvania. Maybe not even Reading in the uh, UK. Um, but no one's ever been brave enough to delete it. Um, because when you're as an academic and someone who knows the field quite well, and I mean, you can take any subject, their normal reaction, if they don't know a thing is to just leave the article there. And then an article can go unrevised for decades before someone will ever touch it. Um, so I think deleting is a very important part of being a national encyclopedia that's actually verified. Because if we don't delete, uh, we will get a lot of content uh, which is there by accident. And selection is, uh, I know it's a bit ironic after I said we publish articles on every bird in the world, uh, but selection is an important part of our model. In our in-house discussion, we talked a bit about um, uh, distinguishing what's embarrassing to publish, because um, on the internet you have a lot of chances to find proper information about Reading, Pennsylvania. And our article stated how many people lived there in 2005, perhaps, which is not the case anymore. And also it said things like, um, it was just obvious things, that they had schools, they had a church, they had uh, workplaces, mm. and that's it. And, and when you go into that the article, various you learn industry. Yeah, various favorite. industry. Uh, and so you, your, our readers come to us and they find no answers. They have verified that this is a place, indeed, in the United States, but they have not learned anything. And our discussion then was, if we have to prioritize uh, our spending budget uh, and what it is important for the Norwegian public to learn properly in depth, um, should we prioritize Pennsylvania uh, and how would our public image be affected by having this kind of crappy content published because it seems like we are outdated and irrelevant and that was uh, the tipping point I think in our internal discussion when I as an editor was embarrassed to read my own article yeah With your stance, but I was just a little bit surprised that, that that's fine for Reading, Pennsylvania, <laughs> but 25,000 articles deleted. Well, we also had some sort of, I'll, I'll just continue, um, we had a lot of sort of small articles because in the encyclopedia we had full page um, articles about countries, for instance, where you had divided into several topics, and when this was uh, digitized, it was cut into pieces um, as if you were using scissors. Mm. Uh, and, and some of these snippets were quite uh, embarrassing to read or didn't make any sense, so we deleted a lot of this. You put it in a, another article, in yes. fact. Yes, yes. Okay. Mm. Mm. Okay, please. Uh, what is your policy on Norwegian towns? What you, which is the lowest level of a town of a settlement to be included in a general type or, or encyclopedia? If it has been declared a town, uh, we should have it. So on the Norwegian towns, everything. And that means 1,000. Um, uh, you can ask us about towns after it's one of our most common discussions in the editorial team is what is a town and the distinction between a berry and a nut. Yeah, you can ask us that later on. Mm. 
But I mean, obviously, we have to cover Norway more extensively than uh, other countries, and we have a lot more about Sweden and Denmark, um, or we should have a lot more. Actually, the country that we have the most articles on, uh, due to the paper encyclopedia, is France. And that's the oddities of having uh, inherited a lot of content from paper encyclopedias. That they had one editor who worked there from 1970 to 1990. He was really quite obsessed about France. Uh, we had articles on people that we claim that contributed to the French Revolution that there were no traces of anywhere else on the internet. Uh, so they got deleted. Um, because if it's only one Norwegian encyclopedia that claims that someone took part in the French Revolution, it's probably not right. And if no one subtitled that article since 1960, it's probably not okay either. Yeah. Now I'm giving you all our dirty linens, um, so um, we're, we're better than we sound um, now. Um, mm. Naya. No, just coming back to uh, the discussion about selection and deletion. Um, and you, na you, you mentioned that uh, now uh, you uh, have an article on every single bird in the world. Mm. And um, by, by having, uh, you said that you were going to, to wait and see how uh, the usage is going to be before you decide whether or not to delete those articles. I just wanted to, to, to say that by having all these articles about every single bird in the world, you actually contribute to Norwegian ornitholo on ornithology terminology. And in that way, you, you also um, help you increase the visibility of Norwegian language online, and by doing that, you also help Norwegian language survive in the hopefully long term. And I'd much rather have not gone every bird in the world than <coughs> small cities in the US or in Germany, because it's quite obvious that someone else will be better at German cities. Um, but no one's better than us on the Norwegian perspective on parrots in Australia. Uh. And I imagine there was a lot of work uh, finding new Norwegian names for at least 3,000 of these birds. No, the Norwegian Ornithology did, Society did, did, did their this. job yep. before, okay. I just had some comment uh, about selecting uh, new entries uh, to the encyclopedia. When it comes to popular culture, you said, it, it, of course, you can't compete with Wikipedia in that, in that perspective. <laughs> but still, for the younger audience, it's, it's yeah. something about identify with the source. You can find things that you're interested in, even though it's not that much about it, maybe, but you put it in a, in a context and you see you, you, we have such things that you also are interested in. So you, you don't have all the dull things. We also have football players and we all musicians and uh, actors and whatever. So, but we choose them. We don't have all of them. Mm. We have the, the most important ones, maybe. So the most, uh, 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 just to say about comparing with the Wikipedia and f the Encyclopedia is that the Wikipedia is including. They have everything. But an uh, is excluding things, so that's the big difference, I think, between Wikipedia and an encyclopedia profession. I think. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I think it's our, it's one of our jobs is to pick, and we should cover. Of course, we should cover popular <coughs> culture, but we don't need to do it as much. And then we're going to cover geography, but. Maybe, you know, a little less uh, or a lot less than even what we're doing now. Because it takes a lot of time to select the 20 most important cities in Japan when you have 80 and you're going to delete 60. Yeah, it takes a lot of time. Um, but I think it's an important thing to do for the future generations of encyclopedia workers. We're going to spare them for what we've um, gone through in the past two or three years. Yep. Hmm. 
there are no comments for now. Uh, I would like to invite Zura Abashidze because he also prepared a presentation on, on Georgian Encyclopedia. And we can continue the discussion later, of course. Well, after, after the presentation of our Norwegian colleague, of Eric, I frankly feel a little bit depressed. I was thinking before I came here to microphone what the hell I am going to talk about. I'm sorry. But so just, uh, just to move, uh, okay, okay, to okay, okay. But then I tried to control my feelings, and I decided that every uh, state of depression has its positive. <laughs> Uh, elements as well. This is a way to find the ways out and to to look about uh, progress. And uh, that's why this meeting is very important, of course, you know, for all of us, but especially for those who are looking for new technologies and uh, Georgian Encyclopedia is one of them. Um, I, I, we are very grateful, I am very grateful to the organizers of our meeting and to uh, that possibility to come to the country which I visited first 47 years ago. I look fine, I know that. Uh, well, uh, I will try to bring now another reality from another part of Europe. And Georgia is part of Europe. And we are trying to become full part of, full member of European Union. We are now fighting to get the status of the candidate members of European Union, along with Ukraine and Moldova. And a very difficult task, really. But uh, we, we, we may manage, we may manage the situation. Uh, my presentation is about the challenges of uh, misinformation. It will be shorter than the, the previous presentation, but I will talk about the challenges that we are facing in our everyday life, not only encyclopedia, of course, but the Georgian society and the, the, the state of that country, the, of, of, the, this country. How should you like, how can I forward, which one I should press, press here to go ahead? How, how to move, how to move? Uh, this one, yeah, this one, okay. So I, the, the brief history, of, I will not make the, the full presentation about encyclopedia, just very brief, uh, uh, comments about it, uh, that encyclopedia and that uh, lexicological studies have a long tradition in Georgia. It started in, 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 in many, many years or generations before. Uh, the modern Georgian encyclopedia was established in 1966 it, during Soviet power. Georgian encyclopedists and famous scientists gathered to work on a world-class Georgian universal encyclopedia. By the way, Georgian encyclopedia was the first national encyclopedia in the Soviet Union in Georgian language. We were the first and Ukrainians were the next. And uh, that's how it started. Uh, uh, I was telling my uh, colleague that the, the great boss of uh, Soviet uh, ideology, uh, Mikhail Suslov personally was against it when he was reported about this uh, uh, initiative to, to start with Georgian Encyclopedia. He said, why do you need uh, Georgian Encyclopedia here? You have Soviet Encyclopedia. Somehow, well, they, they managed to uh, start with and uh, during 1972 and 87, uh, 12 volumes of the Georgian Encyclopedia, Georgian Soviet Encyclopedia were produced. It was sold out very quickly, 80,000 copies, 80,000 copies. 
and big part of the Soviet encyclopedia, big part of relevance and the information which is there is still uh, relevant. Of course, there are a lot of uh, ideological limitations there, but one can find very important information over there, which we are using nowadays as well. Uh, uh, the publication of the multi-volume Encyclopedia Georgia started in 2012. The previous one was Universal Encyclopedia. This one is about only Georgia, universal information about Georgia. And uh, this encyclopedia is based on the latest information and data, as well as on other encyclopedic editions. Uh, editorial board of the Georgian Encyclopedia is working on uh, updating the articles and finding new information for Georgian Encyclopedia G, which is our website. Our staff members and editors is about uh, 30 persons uh, in total, including technical staff. And our budget is less than of Norwegian Encyclopedia. <laughs> uh, and uh, Georgia is popular among uh, libraries about uh, in educational and scientific uh, institutions. This year, we, our website had uh, about 150, oh, I'm sorry, 50,000 visitors, which is quite a number for us. Uh, in 2022, uh, we started working on new website, which is based on modern engine, which is very simple, easy for managing, and easy for the, 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 those who are visiting it. Uh, and uh, technically much more flexible for, for editors, as I already said. Uh, now, well, about uh, challenges of mis misinformation. The main source of mis misinformation in, in nowadays is, comes from our Western neighbor. Uh, Russian misinformation vis-a-vis -vis Georgia has deep roots. It goes to the 19th century since Georgia became part of Russian Empire. Uh, but uh, it became of mass scale after 2008 August War. Georgian-Russian war, I mean. The propaganda machine has been leaded by Mr. Putin personally. In his interview to CNN in August 2008 and afterwards in July 2019, Mr. Putin made several uh, comments on Georgian history and statehood, challenging the concept of country's territorial integrity and sovereignty. Well, in particular, he was talking about Georgia, saying that in Russian Empire there was no Georgia at all. There were only different parts, different provinces of Georgia having different names, but there was no Georgia. Well, that's right, because it was different parts were incorporated into Russian Empire as different provinces. That's why there was no state of uh, Georgia in Russian Empire. And uh, Georgian history did not start in 19th century, which Mr. Putin did not mention. Well, the same goes to Ukraine. As you know, well, Mr. Putin had same remarks and much more attention to uh, Ukraine than to Georgia. He published a big article last year, summer last year, uh, presenting his view on Ukrainian statehood and of course our Ukrainian colleagues uh, responded to it and uh, uh, there are quite argumented and solid answers to that, uh, to that view. Uh, well, uh, there is also a very important point which is about occupied territories since 2008 and Russian intervention into Georgia. There are two regions which are occupied by uh, Georgia, which is Abkhazia and South Ossetia. And uh, another uh, argument by Mr. Putin was uh, that uh, Abkhazia and, and uh, Tsikhin Valley region became part of Russian Empire in 18th century as independent states 
and during the Soviet era, their incorporation in, into Georgia was a political decision when, uh, without solid uh, national uh, historical background. Well, uh, creating a, a solid uh, and argumented response to this uh, misinformation, well, actually, uh, this comments by Mr. Putin gave a, a green light to the huge uh, uh, and very assertive uh, propaganda machine in that regard. It started on a different scale, absolutely, and uh, politicians, scientists, uh, propagandists, <laughs> using this Soviet term, were involved in that propaganda, in, in that uh, effort since 2008. And of course, uh, we had to respond that at creating a, a, a argumented response to this information, misinformation campaign is an everyday work of Georgian scientists and in particular of the Georgian Encyclopedia. Multiple articles, books, conferences and so on were published and organized in that regard. Um, another victim of uh, uh, Russian misinformation is Georgian cultural and historical heritage. It mainly affects historical monuments in occupied Abkhazia and Skinwali region, so-called South Ossetia. The goal is to deprive those monuments of their history and Georgian identity. Uh, there, there are about 600 historical monuments in, to, in that uh, region, churches, monasteries, different uh, fortresses, complexes, monastery complexes, and so on. And, uh, uh, and uh, terrible things happen there. There are, well, two, two pictures, two photos, you can see that. That's how the church of uh, one of the churches in, uh, first of all, is this, the first one is the church of St. George in Svinvali uh, region. This is a uh, church of 12th century with, with a very interesting uh, inscription. That's how it looked before the occupation and that's how it looks like. Uh, this is the church of, of the 8th or 9th century of the Moachabeti. This is again in Trinvali region, that's how it looked before and that's how it looks like nowadays. Uh, and this is only two examples of what I'm talking about. And again, there are more than 600 different historical and uh, 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 monuments in those regions. And uh, now we are working on a special edition, on a special volume which will be uh, dedicated to the historical and cultural monuments of Skinwali region. This is a very difficult task because Georgian scholars are not allowed to visit those regions and we are getting information, photos in different ways. Uh, this book uh, is of a really of a very uh, high level, scientific and political as well. And after it will be completed and published, of course, we will put it on our website. It will be online. And we are also planning to uh, present it to the international, relevant international organizations and international community. Well, there are figures. There are, well, this is the number of churches, fortification buildings, monastery complexes. And all of them are quite important for the, for the history of Georgia and for the world history. History, as we understand. Uh, nowadays, the, the Russian aggression in Ukraine is producing huge amount of fake news of mis and of misinformation. Uh, they are trying to create an alternative reality for the Russian society and outside world. Uh, mm. And uh, unfortunately, Georgia is on the front line of this misinformation uh, campaign. Uh, uh, 
challenging such type of misinformation requires joint international efforts and in particular by the community of European and uh, North American encyclopedias, which a big part of them are present in this audience. And of course, uh, in this regard, uh, it is very important to present to, 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 the, to the society a re reliable uh, uh, information uh, we, we, we should be uh, and a very in important source of information. And I think that we are trying to do that. And uh, this is one of the main tasks of today's uh, work in, in our uh, Georgian Encyclopedia. Well, th there are different kinds of misinformation and fake news. They are coming from different parts of the world. Now, today, is when there is no lack of any, any information. It is sometimes created within, inside the Georgian society and academic world, but it is also produced or affected by outside developments, I mean um, mainly in developments, dramatic de developments in Ukraine. And I, I just brought a one case uh, which is related to a very famous, one of the most famous kings of Georgia of 18th century, Rekla II, during uh, uh, this period mainly in, uh, in, uh, in, in particular in uh, 1783, um, Georgia signed uh, uh, the King of Georgia, Erekle II, was obliged to find big protectors uh, having a huge uh, pressure from Ottoman Empire and Iran at that time when practically Georgia was divided in between those two big empires. So finally he decided to ask uh, Russian uh, Empire, Russian Emperor to, to, to support Georgia as a protectorate of Georgia. Uh, of course maintaining the statehood of uh, the, that kingdom. And finally, the treaty was signed in 1783. Uh, this is mainly about the protectorate of Russia on Georgia. But afterwards, uh, Russia changed its mind and in, two, in 2081, it annexed Georgia. It incorporated Georgia into Russia as in different provinces. So. Since 81, uh, Georgia became part of Russia. Uh, that's why suddenly the big discussion in Georgian society, no, not a big discussion, but very interesting discussion started in Georgia between politicians and some scholars uh, uh, discussing this decision by Heracles II. Small part of uh, politicians and those experts or scholars who support them uh, even decided to label King as pro-Russian because he decided to ask protectorate from Georgia. Uh, uh, so uh, it shows how the today's developments affect even the history of more than 200 years ago or more. Um, and. Uh, this is also some kind of misinformation, if we, we, may lay, we may call it like that, and it is very difficult and it is very important to present the history uh, in such an objective way as not to be influenced uh, by today's developments and not to changing history every day according to the changes of history and uh, uh, of the modern developments. So um, uh, uh, I am happy that we, we have gathered in our uh, Georgian Encyclopedia a very uh, 
uh, famous and uh, uh, experienced experts in history especially and I think that our articles on history are one of the best really and we find the way to how to present it to the young people, to the universities, to the uh, uh, educational institutions and so far we are quite uh, successful in that way. So this is the short presentation which I wanted to make to you and well, if there are any questions I will try to, to answer. Thank you very much, Zurab. I think that your presentation uh, has uh, one more point that it shows us, it shows us all the importance of this kind of meetings uh, where we can exchange our own topics with one each other. And uh, you can point out for us, when we cover Georgian topics, to look to your encyclopedia much more, maybe even to have uh, that more direct collaboration. I was spoken with Walters uh, during the pause and he said that he's interested if we can find some uh, uh, here linguists that can write about uh, Croatian language and other, other South Slav language for Latvian encyclopedia and then when I told him how much we are paying he said that he will uh, gladly write articles about Latvian history and every other topic and Belmondo too. Although we have a new article written by me, so it's a, it's a brilliant one uh, uh, in uh, Croatian encyclopedia. But this kind of what you just showed us, the, uh, that begins with the problem of uh, misinformation by the, let's say, uh, under the parenthesis, the big nation or imperialistic nation or something like that. Uh, for us, for, from let's say smaller nation is very, very useful and uh, uh, to find right information and to exchange that kind of information. The colleagues from Slovakia contacted us a few months ago uh, and consulted us with an uh, uh, article about our founder, uh, uh, writer uh, Miroslav Krleža, the, that we check the, and we gladly do that, did that. So we will contact them from some Slovakian, uh, or Slovakian writer or some Slovakian topic. And this conference, I think, uh, uh, one of the goals of the, this kind of conference is that uh, brings us more together in exchanging uh, our knowledge about those topics. Yeah, absolutely, I agree with you. Uh, as to the uh, articles and information which is produced in our uh, encyclopedia, especially on history, it, it is prepared at the editor's level. It goes through various levels of filter. You know, first it's prepared on, on by our editor, then it goes to the editorial uh, consulting board, then it goes to the uh, main editorial board, uh, well, the, our well-known historians and so on. So uh, I think that uh, those materials are quite qualified. So we will be happy to share it with you. And the same goes to, to us. You know, of course, our encyclopedia is mainly, well, the, the edition which I pointed to Encyclopedia Georgia is about Georgia, but it is not only about Georgians, you know, because we, we have and we used to have contacts with outside world and these outside contacts are also included to this, uh, uh, to this uh, information and uh, we would be happy to have this type of uh, exchange of uh, information in order to have really solid and reliable uh, sources and, uh, and material. Okay, thank okay. you, Sura. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you. you very much. And uh, since the aim of this panel was to give a brief overview of our activities and obstacles, challenges, and achievements in the past uh, three years, so I would like to ask if there are maybe I know Dragana would like to say something, yeah, but if anybody else also wants to contribute to this panel, just feel free to, to, to yeah. Okay, Dragana, yeah. yeah 
Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I'm Dragana Dubljevic from Montenegrin Academy of Sciences and Arts. Uh, specifically, uh, I work in uh, Lexicographic Center. Uh, we are scientific and research center in the uh, academy, and we are a very young uh, center. Uh, we uh, have started with lexicographic projects uh, uh, in 2018, so four years ago, and we faced many cha challenges, as all of you, uh, during these uh, past three years. Uh, but uh, fortunately, uh, we have some uh, great uh, results. Uh, uh, we, uh, we work on eight uh, lexicons. Uh, they are national lexicons. And this year, uh, we published uh, two lexicons. That's the lexicon of diplomacy of Montenegro and the lexicons of fine arts uh, of Montenegro in two, two volumes. Uh, also, what is very important, uh, we have um, online editions uh, simultaneously uh, with uh, printed editions, and we consider all these projects as a preparation for uh, a national encyclopedia. Uh, we plan to start activities uh, next year. Uh, so uh, we are very proud of, of what we have done uh, uh, despite Corona crisis and uh, uh, um, everything what what happened uh, during uh, these three years and uh, I would like to uh, pay special attention and to thank uh, to our colleagues from uh, Zagreb uh, without them and their experience and share the knowledge we we uh, we couldn't do what we have done until now uh, and also uh, we uh, are very recognized in Montenegro and. Uh, the lexicon that, that is published uh, this year, uh, the lexicon of fine arts of Montenegro, was awarded uh, 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 was awarded at the uh, 16th International uh, Book Fair in Podgorica as a, a publishing venture and also for a best equipped art edition. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I just wanted to, to share this uh, experience uh, with you and, uh, uh, and to uh, send uh, regards from the president of Montenegrin Academy of Sciences and Arts. Uh, and um, that's what I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dragana, very much. And you. I think that you forgot to tell us that you have also a website. Yes, yes, we have also a website, uh, and uh, yes, thank you, <laughs> Bruno. Uh, uh, we have a website uh, for uh, uh, these two lexicons that we published on the official site of Montenegrin Academy of Sciences and Arts. So uh, you can uh, uh, you can just link uh, to 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 this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I, I will now, uh, 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 as a host, just take your time a little more, uh, just to share with you uh, what happened here in the last three years. Uh, uh, and I will just point out that uh, we are in this more or less beautiful building that seems like a castle, but for some of us is more like a prison. Uh, at least that some of our workers says, but never mind, as they have to revise and update all those articles. Uh, but uh, in fact, the Creation Encyclopedia, which is a general encyclopedia, which was published in uh, 11 uh, volumes uh, from 1999 to 2009, which was the fourth completed edition of the general encyclopedia in Croatia. The first one is in the 50s, the second edition in the 60s, the, seventh, uh, the third edition in the late 70s and early 80s, and this was the fourth one, under the different names, but never mind. Uh, the Croatian Encyclopedia is, in fact, just a part of the production of the Institute. Uh, if we look up uh, for in our uh, uh, editorial staff, we have only 11 full-time editors in the Croatian Encyclopedia. That, so we are much smaller than our brilliant colleagues from, from Norway, uh, even smaller than 
Denmark, as I gather, even smaller than Latvia. No. Oh, damn, ne never mind. <laughs> but we have uh, other, other uh, projects, other editions here in the Institute of which the most important is our uh, Croatian Biographical Dictionary, which is a dictionary of national uh, biography. Uh, and obviously, we don't have also any more much authors. We have about 30 authors, including staff and including some, let's say, 10 authors who are also working at the Institute, but are editors in other, other projects. And about maybe 10 or 15 at most uh, uh, external, external authors. So in that regard, we are rather a small project, let's say. But what I wanted to share with you is that uh, the first lockdown uh, in 2020 uh, uh, was in a way a uh, uh, blessing in disguise. Uh, in a way that uh, it propped up our, uh, our web uh, site that we had in 2020 uh, as you can see, almost 7 million unique visitors, which was almost 3 million more than we had a year, a year earlier. And we have the 15,000 page views, which, which was about 5 million more page views than we had a year earlier. We have a boom of uh, visitors and page views and if you, if you can uh, as you can see in the, for the next two years there was a, somehow a drop in both unique visitors and page views and we hope that we will by this year stabilize that number at about let's say 13 million page views and about six and a half million uh, unique visitors so for us uh, that what happened uh, two years ago for us as a website as a web encyclopedia, as a web provider of knowledge, of encyclopedic knowledge, was uh, in a way a good thing because many kids stayed stayed uh, at home, S school was from the home, many people worked at home and probably they didn't know what to do so th they were looking at our encyclopedia among others. And I suppose that that's the kind of thing that you all had the sort of uh, big boom uh, in or if you didn't know, maybe you can share with us uh, uh, the big boom uh, in the, in the uh, unique visitors and page views. And what I wanted to share also with you is we uh, somehow we gave the most viewed, uh, most searched uh, articles uh, in, uh, our, uh, on our web page. And uh, one thing is that there, are, there is always some articles that are always searched. Those are some, let's say, fundamental articles from the general culture. Mathematical symbols, numbers, Newton's laws, Renaissance, uh, Roman Empire, and articles like such. Some are specific articles, creation, homeland war, war for independence uh, in early 90s, is always amongst the most searched articles in, in encyclopedia. But some articles are searched at that time, at that time only. So in 2020, we had among the most searched articles, obviously about earthquakes, because we had here in Zagreb, there was a few earthquakes uh, at that time. So many people searched about earthquakes and we responded and we had a bigger article about earthquakes, about many terms regarding earthquakes. Here is with us our brilliant editor of, of physics, mathematics and geophysics, Antoniella, who wrote in a short, times, short uh, time all those articles, revised them. And then we had obviously the article about epidemic, about uh, COVID um, uh, disease, uh, virus. Uh, those were search articles and in 2022, among the most viewed articles were well, obviously Ukraine, Russia, uh, denazifications, then uh, an article about World War, which is in fact searched because of the parallels and of the uh, increasing interest in historical topics among, among uh, the readers of our encyclopedia. So I just wanted in this brief, brief intervention to point out how there is always a sort of uh, uh, corpus of articles that's always among the most searchable ones. 
probably the, those kind of articles will find their place in the small Norwegian encyclopedia, encyclopedia for kids to have their general culture covered. And there are those articles in which we are kind of, a, may I say newspaper, but kind of information website. A site that gives information about denazification. Uh, we had this big debate here in Croatia uh, when uh, there was an, uh, in the first days of invasion uh, in the spring, how we shall uh, transliterate Ukrainian names, names of Ukrainian cities, Ukrainian towns, because there was a tradition we took the names from the uh, via uh, Russia, via Russian. Uh, channels and we decided here uh, in Croatian Encyclopedia that we will switch all them to the uh, so-called scientific transliteration that is from the Ukrainian source. Only th for now we stayed with Kiev transliterated uh, because it becomes sort of a um, uh, domestic name here here in Croatia. We as sort of appropriate that that uh, appropriate that name, but. That also uh, uh, shows how uh, there was some topics that we, uh, we had to answer immediately. And I suppose that also, also the thing that uh, you are all uh, concerned with and you all have to, uh, to solve those kind of problems. have additional comments or questions or interventions <laughs> thank you for the brief description how did you get these uh, numbers regarding ages from google analytics it is some kind of not so relevant, but uh, I think ev everyone is, uh, uh, everyone took Google Analytics as primary source, so. Short question, so you have, uh, well, you are in an excellent position because of language, so you could have a very wide influence on the neighboring countries. So, do you have numbers? How many readers do you have in Serbia, Bosnia, Montenegro? Uh, because, well, article on math doesn't matter where it's created, so you have a market actually there. I can, I, it can be extracted from Google Analytics as well, but now we, we didn't do that. Maybe we can do it for tomorrow. Where? Yeah, yeah, I know. I know, I know, yeah, yeah, but yeah. Okay. We will provide the data for tomorrow, we promise. Some articles are very uh, 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 viewed in some articles, but m mostly controversial topics, uh, political topics, are more viewed than uh, these plain topics, let's say, uh, like um, numbers or things like that. But we can we can uh, uh, check for for in a few hours. So. I'm not sure if we can do it on the article level, just uh, readership yeah. in general. I'm not I'm not sure, but yeah, the readership from yeah. And, this. and the thing is, as we are as we are a free access encyclopedia. Uh, for us, it's always good to have much more unique visitors and much more. Uh, but in terms of financial uh, financial response, it's not existing. I was um, when you start talking about renaming cities in uh, in Ukraine. I mean, we've obviously done the same. I'm guessing all of you have done the same. Uh, we also we renamed Kiev too. Uh, we now only have one Russian-based place name left in Ukraine, and that's Crimea, uh, which is called Krim in Norwegian, and it looks too strange to call it Krim. But we also changed the uh, country name of Belarus, um, uh, because it's been called White Russia in Norwegian for, I don't know, yeah, several hundred years, uh, with 800 articles that mentioned Belarus uh, in the encyclopedia. It was uh, quite 
nightmarish. I'm sort of guessing that this will hit us quite a bit more in the years to come. I'm suspecting that there will be more sort of renamings um, in um, in the years to come. It's been sort of good to practice a bit on um, on um, yeah Ukraine. So uh, yeah, I think I think it's interesting. If there are no more comments or questions. Well, now it's it's time that we uh, just broadcast this video from... So we are especially pleased that our Ukrainian colleague, Oleksandr Ryshenko, sent the recording of, of his uh, short speech in which he, he, he describes what the Ukrainians are going through at the moment and also their latest achievements of the... Uh, the latest achievements of the Ukrainian encyclopedia. And since uh, Walters was uh, in contact with, with uh, them and maybe has some input or, or something that he would like to share. Yeah, now or, or maybe after. Well, was, okay, 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 yeah. Dear colleagues, thank you for the opportunity to say a few words to you. We are said that this war this unthinkable war is going on in Europe in the 21st century. We are sad that we can't take part in this solid conference offline, but we believe that uh, sooner or later we will host all of you in Kyiv at one of the next conferences. First of all, thank you very much for your support of Ukraine and our encyclopedia. In the first days of the Russian aggression, we received deep words of support from many of you. In addition, there were also your suggestions to help the staff of our encyclopedia. Thank you for this. In the spring, despite difficulties of the war, our team resumed work and was able to prepare another volume of the Encyclopedia of Modern Ukraine with 3,000 articles. These articles are already available online, but the volume not yet published. We plan to print a small run, much smaller than in previous years. Currently, the Encyclopedia includes over 67,000 articles. This is the largest Ukrainian encyclopedia of all time. This year, the work of our team would be impossible without the success of the armed forces of Ukraine, as well as the military and humanitarian aid of European countries, USA, Canada and other countries worldwide. All democratic world understands the Russian aggression is a war not only against Ukraine but also against Europe and our common unity gives confidence in a clear victory. This will be a joint victory. Financially the next year will be difficult for us. We plan to focus only on the online version of the encyclopedia and actively update the articles. Up-to-date knowledge is a very important, important today. As to the current encyclopedia conference, uh, we share your opinion about the need to resolve the problem, the priority of, of encyclopedic information in Google and in other search systems. Currently, for people, we especially feel the great importance of the relevance of reliable, truthful information. Unfortunately, this information has flooded the information environment. The fight, the fight against fakes is a common front of, of all of us. Well, we wish you the conference was interesting and effective. Thank you and good luck.
Would you like to share some thoughts? I'll stay here. Uh, yeah, I have been uh, once in Kiev in, was it 20? 18 or something like that. And then uh, I, uh, two weeks ago I had a long conversation with uh, Mikola, who is the director of the institute, and Alexander was also present. So uh, what can I add? It's just a war, real war there, and its conditions are accordingly very, very difficult. So before, before the war, uh, I think uh, Ukrainian encyclopedia was had some issues related to financial things and, and institutional, structural, etc. Well, war is not making it easier, it's making it more difficult, definitely. And so uh, I was asking, uh, well, we were mo talking more kind of general things, like a feeling, what do you feel, how it's to be. He said, yeah, in the beginning of the war, it was particularly difficult because you remember Russian army uh, approached Kyiv. Uh, but then he said, uh, uh, yeah, we are adjusting, so humans can adjust to everything, so just uh, go on, and uh, it's kind of uh, becoming normal life for them. Uh, but uh, next winter will be very, very difficult. Uh, he mentioned they, they won't be paid for heating at all, so they, they should consider wor uh, working at home, so it's a, it's a completely different situation, and therefore, I think, any discussions on uh, any reforms or whatever in Ukraine should, well, I think my my personal stand is uh, I would uh, like to support just Ukraine, Ukrainian encyclopedia, and that's it. And after the war, we'll, we can discuss on how to uh, reorganize, restructure, help them to just rebuild this. But now it's just a very, very difficult situation. and. Uh, I think the help is needed there, and that's it. And really, they appreciate uh, we are talking about them, we are supporting them mentally or otherwise, and they, they feel it, and it's important for them. Okay, so I think it's time to conclude this session. So we are an hour ahead. <laughs> Not so bad at all. Okay, so thank we started early. No. <laughs> okay, so thank you all for this, uh, for your participation, for this discussion, and uh, we can continue to socialize a bit yeah, here. We can at the lobby. There is also. <laughs> okay then, and then we will start tomorrow again at ten thirty.